right, y'all already know how it is. New RPG Maker, new breakdown video. Let's go. This is every difference between RPG Maker Unite and the previous RPG Makers in about 25-ish minutes. So buckle up, take some notes, because this is going to be a long video. So the general layout is already pretty different from your typical RPG maker. You're going to have the sections and objects to modify on the left, and all the details and things you can configure for an object or piece of data are on the right. Now while these layouts aren't like finely crafted like they were in early RPG makers, you can still condense these categories if things look a bit too cluttered, and they even stay that way when you leave and come back. There's also this big middle preview screen, which shows what you're working on. So say for example, you're working on title stuff, it'll show the title. Obviously, if you're working on the map, it'll show the map, but it will also show things like when you're working on the settings for certain pieces of the menu. Now, one of the benefits the Unity Editor brings is the ability to rearrange these top level editor sections. You can like drag them out and have them be floating dialogues, which is like really helpful if you have two monitors and especially helpful if you have four. But even if you're a single monitor pleb, you can benefit. I personally like moving these two side columns up to the sides like this, and it gives like way more space for editing stuff. And if you want to bring everything back to normal, go to Window, RPG Maker, Mode, and select your current mode. These three modes let you decide between whether you want the RPG Maker Custom Editor, a combination between the RPG Maker Editor and the Unity Editor, or just the Unity Editor itself. Once you're in the Unity Editor, you can switch back by also going to Window, RPG Maker, and selecting the original Focused Mode. Even within the RPG Maker Editor Mode, you still have access to all of Unity's preferences and all of Unity's project settings. I'm not going to go through all of these because these are like just the default things that Unity provides, but you can configure your project any way you like with these. In terms of theming, if you go back to preferences, you'll find your two Unity themes, Dark and Light, which I guess is technically a downgrade from RPG Maker's four themes with uh, the high contrast black and white. RIP to those people who love those. Though if you switch to Unity mode, you can install third-party themes that will also work with your RPG Maker editor, so I guess that's a plus all around. Finally, in terms of general editor stuff, we have New Project, Open Project, Save Project. We have the Build Project, which also gives you all the Unity build options right here. And then you have Close Project, Test Project, and then the Add-on List. Within New Project, there's now a choice between whether you want the sample game or the basic assets. The basic assets mode is similar to what you would expect from older RPG makers, where you'll have just a blank map, but you'll still have all of the sample database things and all the default RTP assets. On the other hand, sample game will contain all of that, plus a fully functional game. So let's get into playtesting. While you're playtesting, you have access to all of Unity's basic debugging features. So for example, you can see all the gizmos, you can turn on FPS and other various stats. You can zoom into the game like this, configure the resolution at runtime, select the display, and then also whether you're using the game or the simulator, just your typical Unity stuff. So let's say I choose a Samsung S10 Plus. We can then use that, scale some more, fit the screen, etc., etc. So let's talk about maps. By default, all your maps are gonna be listed in alphabetical order in the map settings map list, unless you have chapters and stuff set up in the outline manager, in which case maps will also appear in the outline section, but we'll get more into that later. Controls work same as before, left click to draw, right click to copy a certain area and then paste it down wherever you want to put it. All your basic tools are back with the addition of a new tool, the erase tool, which now allows you to erase tiles, which for some reason wasn't a thing you can do before. But where things get interesting is the new tiling system. Instead of before, where tiles had to be added to tile sets and those tile sets were then processed through RPG Maker, tiles are now added as individual images. Then in the tile group, you create these tile groups that work kind of like tile sets, but you can add as many or as few tiles you want to them. So for example, this is our world A1. Let's go and add this mossy cobbly thing to the group. So I hit add to group. And now this mossy grass one is right here. From there, go to your map, choose one of the layers, load tile group, load the A1 tile group. And now all the tiles from that group have been added to this map's palette. 
it's a little tedious, but it gives a lot more control and ease of use when it comes to working with tiles. Random map encounters cannot be configured for not only troops, but also individual enemies, collision configuration using these new region systems, and there is now an option to add a background to a map, which works similarly to Parallax except it's static and doesn't repeat. Events now look like this. All of the pages and event settings are on the right, the event actions are on the bottom, and then when you select an action, the options for that action appear in the right bottom area right here. The event settings are the same except for the ability to configure whether this event appears for a certain chapter or section, and the ability to import and export templates, which are just saved versions of an event that you can re-import later. There's also a new condition called switch item, which will enable the event if the player has this specific item. The event image can either be one of the character images available in your project or a pre-existing character to make things easier. And finally, in the direction input, you can select a movement direction or the direction of the player or the damage image for the NPC. There are new quick events. There are now save point, shop, and monster chest. Event actions have a bunch of new changes too. One of them is show messages new ability to edit the message directly on the event. All the options are the same, but you can now select a bust image and have everything filled in automatically using an actor or a preset NPC. The events now have a new organized dialogue where they have different sections that can be dropped down and even subsections like this. Conditional branch was renamed to branch settings and it now allows for multiple conditions to be checked simultaneously. Set movement route has a new system where you can click the tiles you want the route to be, like so. But as a result of this new system, Set Movement Route has lost a lot of its existing features. Thankfully, most still exist, as they've been converted into their own events. Step Forward Backward, Change Speed, Frequency Through, etc. are all still available, but there are a few missing, so RIP to all the niche movements that didn't quite make the cut. Besides that, every RPG Maker MZ event returns to Unite with the following exceptions. Change enemy HP, MP, and TP was combined into alter enemy parameters. Enemy recover all was removed. Change tile set was removed as tile sets no longer exist in Unite. And script call was removed unfortunately, most likely due to technical reasons as C sharp code cannot be called without precompiling. The Outline Editor is a completely new feature to RPG Maker, and uh, while it looks all fancy, all it technically does is organize your maps for development. As shown before, you can access all your maps in this big list here, but you can't rearrange them or put them in folders. But what you can do is create chapters in the Outline section. Within those chapters, you create sections, and then within those sections, you can add as many maps as you want. You can actually add the same map to different sections multiple times, and you can also have maps that aren't a part of any section or in the outline. Now, once you do add a chapter or a section, it appears in the outline manager and you can like move it or connect it as you want. This is just an organization tool though, so the way you move things or connect them doesn't affect the game itself, so keep that in mind. Technically, you don't actually need to use the outline editor at all. You can just make your games all classic RPG Maker style, but it's pretty helpful to have this visual layout you can go to at any time. If you actually click on one of the sections, it'll highlight itself in the list too. So it also works as like a really great method for navigating your, you know, cluttered ass list on the left. Okay, now we can finally break down every little section in the database. But just so I don't repeat myself, let's go over all the general UE changes and tropes we see throughout the new user interface. Like I discussed before, you have these collapsible groups you can use to organize things. The color inputs now use the built-in Unity color input. There's also a new font input, which is used in a lot of places to select a system font for your game. And the dropdowns for other database items, so for example when you're selecting a class from an actor, now provide a search bar so you can search for like ninja and find what you're looking for a lot easier. Instead of the usual map dialogue, things that require selecting a tile on a map now use the start editing button, which allows you to select a certain tile from the map and then you hit stop editing and that saves that position. When it comes to places where you need to select an image, 
Unite will now give two methods. You have like the OG RPG Maker method where you select a file from the designated project directory or the new import button can be used to open a file dialog that allows you to select any image on your computer that when chosen will be copied over to your project. The notes section has actually gotten better. It looks small now, but you can actually hold shift and enter to create an infinite number of lines for your notes. Like with tiles, icons no longer have an icon set. Instead, each icon is its own file that you can select. The way traits was set up was we worked from this list slash dialogue combo to uh, <laughs> this monstrosity. It looks tiny and weird, but when I went through, I can confirm that every option and trait that existed before is still here. I'd also like to point out that a lot of the names for parameters and resistances and stuff like that have been drastically improved. I'll put up a quick reference here. So things like target rate has been replaced with aggro rate, attack speed is now attack speed modifier, attack times plus is now number of additional attacks, so general improvements like that. And the last little thing I want to point out that's applicable to the database as a whole is the inclusion of this new auto guide system. Now this is a system unique for every little database entry depending on what you're looking at. So for example, enemies can generate parameters based on certain factors like estimated encounter level, the number of attacks, and all the stuff listed here. And there's also ones for equipment and skills and I believe items too. And I'll cover all of those in detail once we get there. Oh, okay. So now I'm going to spend the rest of this video going through every section from top to bottom to point out every new feature or input that didn't exist before. <clears throat> okay, let's do this. So, starting from the top, we have the initial settings, which sort of replaces the system settings from earlier RPG makers. From here, we can customize the title. This includes stuff like text configuration for the title, the background image, whether certain options appear or not, and its own brand new note box. The menus are configured in the UE settings. UE Pattern selects between three new main menu layouts, including Basic, Simple, and finally, portrait. The type of actor image shown can also be changed between obviously the face icon, the character that appears on the map, the bust image, or nothing at all. The default menu font, font size, and font color can be selected, and the background can be changed to an image or just a basic color. A fascinating thing about Unite is it no longer uses window skins, uh, but you can still customize windows by assigning a color or image to the window background, frame, highlight, button background, and button frame. So it's still kind of the same as before, but like a lot of other Unite changes, it's been reworked to allow customization in the editor instead of just customizing things by changing images externally. The game menu shows previews for all the sub-menus such as items, skills, equipment, etc. All of the options here are the same as they were before, but I just wanted to show off all the differences and how the menus look now. The battle menu is pretty minimalistic, though now you can hide HP and MP. The dialog box section actually contains some pretty interesting stuff. Right here, you can set whether the name box is shown and the type of image that's displayed for the dialog. But please note that these settings aren't global. You can actually configure these per each show message. And when you change them here, all you're doing is changing the default. It doesn't retroactively change them for existing show message events. But that's different for the font settings, which do configure the font for both the name and the dialog boxes globally for the project. Choices also have their own font settings, and then numerical input and item selection provide font settings and the ability to configure the positions, which do affect all instances of these events. Unite's term settings are the same as they were in RPG Maker MZs. The only difference is some of the descriptions are different from what they were before. The options section contains all the checkboxes you used to see in the system settings for other RPG makers. They're all here except for two, display TP and window, which we saw earlier in the battle menu settings, and EXP for reserve members, which appears to have just been removed entirely. And then finally is system settings. This lets you select the platform. I'm not really sure what that does. Same with resolution, which I'm also not sure because you can go to edit, project settings and select the resolution and various window settings here. You can also configure whether or not your game can use a controller. Now note that this doesn't disable keyboard controls, those will always be available, but this lets you configure whether or not a controller can be used on top of that. 
All right, time for character settings. In the default party settings, you can configure the party size, which apparently is restricted to only four party members. When you select one of the numbers, the amount of party members you can configure is increased or decreased. Actors are the same as they were before. These are the player characters you can add to your party and play as. The only two new things is you can now select an element to associate with an actor, and you can also select a bust image to be used with your actor. Now, similar to actors is the NPC section. NPCs also let you select a name, a note box, and various face and picture images, but unlike actors, you can't play as them. Instead, these work as presets for show message options that we saw earlier. The vehicle list is a brand new addition, allowing you to add as many custom vehicles as you please. For each vehicle, you get a name, a movement speed, you know, their starting position, the sound that plays when you enter the vehicle. And while you can't see it here, if you go to the map settings and then the tile groups, you can configure which tile allows which vehicle to pass it. So for example, the water tile allows for the ship vehicle to go through it. The final section for characters is the classes. Now this has a global shared settings page, which lets you set the maximum level, clear level, max EXP, max HP, and whether whether certain parameters are enabled or not. As for each class itself, there's actually been a lot that's changed. You can associate an element with the class. The allowed weapon types and armor types have their own new input section. You can select new skills for the class to learn, but what's notable about this is the type of skill that's used is no longer attached to the skill itself, and also there's no longer a note box here either. The EXP curve section is now just back to three inputs. The class parameters look the same as always, but now they have a new input called peak growth level, and all the stats together have an auto guide system for configuring how the stats should look in relation to each other. Hit rate, evasion rate, critical hit rate, and aggro rate are new inputs. Now, just to be clear, these aren't new stats, as you can always configure these with traits, but I guess these four are now a little easier to access. All right, now here is the edit battle section. The first part is the fight scene options. Now the most notable thing about the battle configuration is that the enemies can no longer have their position be dragged and dropped wherever you want them to be. They're now configured based on these parameters right here. For front view, you have every monster's base Y position. And then in side view, you have a bit more options, including the party position and the party slant. So we can make that sweet like 10. And then of course the enemy slant can be set to a negative value to slant them in the other way too. Or you can, you can put zero just to not move them at all. Another important thing in this section is that the battle test has been moved to here instead of where the troops were. So let's go ahead and get to enemies. Like with actors and classes, you can associate a certain element with an enemy. There's the auto guide parameter system that we talked about earlier. There's a new display size section, which lets you set a display type of small, large, and boss, but you can also set the scale manually by setting it to smaller or bigger based on how you want the enemy to look. You can also set the alignment for the enemy image based on how you want it to look. So you can make it so the enemy's position sets the image above it or below it or automatically. Rewards have improved as there's no longer a maximum and you can reward players with an indefinite number of possible items. And while it looks condensed, the attack patterns has all the same features as it did before. Troops have been renamed to enemy groups and pretty much do the same thing. They combine enemies together to create battle scenarios. A battle background can now be associated with an enemy group. There's also these new conditions that can be associated with an enemy that's a part of the group. So say there's two goblins, you can set one of the goblins condition to be enemy appears mid battle or during a certain turn. However, as I mentioned before, you can't drag the enemies anymore. And there also doesn't appear to be troop events anymore, but maybe I'm missing something? I don't know. All right, time for some epic skills. Here we go. For starters, the damage formula settings allow us to set formulas specific for each category of skill. Coming over here, we have our basic skills like attack and guard. And then of course we have our custom skills like these. When it comes to the skills themselves, the only notable change for like the basic stuff is just that messages only have one line and no longer have the autofill buttons. But where stuff gets crazy is these two bottom sections, effect on target and effect on user. Both both of these sections have the same content, but obviously one of them is for 
for the target that the skill is used on, and one of them is for the skill user. What was originally the scope dialog is now range, and it has all the same options as before. What was originally invocation is now called activation, and it has all the same stuff except for TP gain, which has been moved somewhere else. Now this is where stuff got upgraded. Recovery was originally like this dialog where you had to open it up and set individual settings, but now you can configure it to have recover HP, MP, or TP, and you can do all of them, one of them, or none of them. Each of these have a lot more control where you can set a formula or a percent of the maximum value or a recovery max and fixed recovery. And then finally, a random variance can be applied to all of these. The damage section is also pretty big, now providing two different sections, free input, where you can use your classic RPG maker formula, you know, hit them with that Pythagorean ass math problem versus the auto guide, or the process is just automated with general information, which is uh, not as interesting, but could be helpful. There's no longer an HP or MP recover option. There's a new attack type input, but besides that, you have the same options. And that about wraps it up. The final section is the effects. Notably, in the other section, both grow and learn skill are missing, but these can still be achieved using common events. And then as discussed before, effect on user is a new section that has a subset of everything available on effect on target, allowing you to configure what happens to the user when the skill is applied. All right, time for states. It has a separate section for all the special states, such as dead and guard. And within custom states are all the customizable states you can use for your game. There's a new input called apply state, which allows you to choose whether the state can only be applied during battle, during movement, or always. There's also a new state restriction for escaping a battle. Auto removal conditions have been reworked just a little, splitting certain inputs based on the scenario. And then finally, the new effect frequency section allows you to provide the number of steps that a player must walk before a state is applied to them on the overworld. All right, time for weapons, armors, and items. Applicable to all of these is the price input is now split into two, the buying price and the selling price. And each can also be configured to be used as a switch conditional item or not. Besides that, both weapons and armors have their own auto guide system. And specifically to items, similar to how skills were, there's now an effect on target and effect on user section with all the same inputs as before. All right, now for the types. Same as before, there's still five major type categories, elements, skill types, weapon types, armor types, and equipment types. Elements are especially important now. As you may have noticed, actors, classes, and enemies can all be associated with a certain element, because elements can also now be assigned a strength and weakness effect. So for example, I can make it so ice is weak against uh, fire by a rate of 200%. Next are the skill types, where for each skill type you can decide whether or not it has a cast animation. And for the weapon types, you can now choose what the player side view animation is used based on thrust, swing, or projectile, and it can be given its own unique image. And then finally, armor types and equipment types don't have any new inputs. Uh, uh, <laughs> So animations were renamed to battle effects, and like with RPG Maker MZ, they still use effects here. From what I can tell, they have all the same options as before. Just note if you want to play the animation, you press the play button right here, and then you can change the enemy and all the other stuff. Common events are back, and as far as I can tell, they are exactly the same as they were before, unlike Resource Manager, which is actually drastically different now. Originally, the Resource Manager was a way for you to manage the file system, but now the Resource Manager is a way for you to organize and customize animations. For example, instead of having a set sprite sheet for all character animations to use, you now must input your own sprite sheet, import it as a field character, and then you can set the number of frames and the animation speed for the character. You now also need different images for every direction and animation the character has. The same is also applicable to the resource manager objects, which are sort of like the event characters. So yeah, similar to tiles, it makes things a lot more tedious, but at the same time you now have way more control over how things work in your game. You can now also add as many 
many balloon icons as you want. And every little animation for the battlers can now be configured in this section right here. As was shown with the weapon types, you can now add and use as many weapon animations as you want, and of course configure the frames and the animation speed. And the same applies to state animations. Bro, how, how did this even happen? Wait. There are two sections for configuring switches and configuring variables. Uh, they're pretty much the same as they were before, with the notable exception that there's now a find button. While there was a find system in RPG Maker MV and MZ, you had to go to a separate dialog to use it. Here, you just gotta go to your switch and click find, and it'll find all the notable uses throughout your project. And then finally, the final section in the database for RPG Maker Unite are the sample maps. Now, these appear to be the exact same sample maps from RPG Maker MZ, correct me if I'm wrong. So yeah, nothing of note here. Besides all of this, the only thing that's missing is the character creator. There's currently no character creator for RPG Maker Unite, though I should note there is like a whole system for creating your own Vroid characters and importing them into Unite using a tool. And then also technically you should be able to take custom characters created in RPG Maker MV or MZ and then just bring them over to your Unite project. But of course, be sure to consult with licenses and stuff like that first. But yeah, that's all the new changes I could find. I'm sure I missed something, and if I did, let me know in the comments below. Thank you for making it this far in the video, yada yada yada. Be sure you follow me on Twitter or TikTok, and thank you for watching. I hope this video helped. Uh, until next time, which hopefully should be sooner rather than later. Wink wink. <laughs> uh, goodbye. One, two, three, boop, one, two, three, boop, one, two, three, boop, triangle time. Okay.